Welcome to our brand new show, The Islamic Dilemma. I am your host, Al Fadi. Joining me here today, my special guest, Bill Warner. Welcome, Bill. Delighted to be here. Uh, as we mentioned to you in our previous episode, that the intent behind our program is to basically provide our viewers, especially the non-Arabic uh, speakers, uh, with uh, an in-depth analysis of the teachings of Islam, uh, its doctrines, the Quran, and all of the other sources uh, that Islam basically relies upon. Uh, wouldn't you agree, Bill? Yes, and I think our viewers will find it is a fascinating subject. Absolutely. Well, last time we gave an overview of a variety of topics, but uh, today I am pleased uh, uh, to tell you that we are going to start a series of episodes that will analyze the Quran uh, more in depth. Now, uh, some people like you, Bill, uh, for instance, uh, have studied uh, the Quran intensively, and you have done some analyses about that. Mm -hmm. Would you uh, be willing to tell us a little bit more about that? Well, I'm a scientist, so my approach to the Quran is, is that it's data. It's just information, text, words on a page. So this gives me a dispassionate view. I'm neither, I approach it as either belief nor disbelief, just in the same way you would a lab. To me, this is a laboratory experiment. And so, therefore, I'm interested in, my first thing that I was interested in was get it to make sense. You know, mm -hmm. Everybody's confused. And so I began to, as I sorted things out, uh, as we've mentioned earlier, I began to realize that there was an early Quran and a later Quran. But now when you look in the book, they don't tell you that. Right. And let's explain to our viewer what that means. Uh, basically, the early Quran that uh, Bill is referring to is what is called the Meccan Quran. It's called mm -hmm. Meccan Quran simply because it was Mecca. revealed in Mecca. That's the name of the town where uh, Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, started it. Uh, his uh, mission as a prophet. Mm -hmm. uh, that's roughly started it between 610 A.D. to around 622 uh, A.D., at which point, basically, Muhammad decided that he wants to move now north to another town. Well, now the uh, Meccans helped persuade him. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, there was some persuasion, of course. I mean, his major claim was that his immigration, actually, had to do with a threat against his life. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, whether that's true or not is yet to be uh, determined. Now, when he moved to Medina, that's what we call the second Quran. Yes. Now, can you help us, Bill, understand why uh, you called it the second Quran? What was the, so the difference between the two, for instance? Well, the difference is quite startling. Uh, when you start off in Mecca, some of the first revelations are, could almost be called hymns to God and quite religious. Uh, but then when you get to Medina, it reads like a law text. I mean, literally, like a law text or sometimes a military text, but it's, it's, it's quite different. It's not so religious at all. And that is true. And, and, and I want to remind our uh, viewers, by the way, that you cannot just open the Quran and, uh, you know, you can immediately tell uh, which part was in Mecca and which part was in Medina. Actually, all of the chapters in the Quran are commingled together. Mm -hmm. uh, and you really have to search hard to find which one belongs to which period. Uh, I mean, ironically, sometimes even portions of a chapter belong to one period mm -hmm. and the other portion belongs to another. Sometimes a whole chapter belongs to Mecca and only one verse belongs to Medina and vice versa. So you can understand now why it is so important for us to have a show like this and at the same time to be able to explain things like this uh, uh, to you also in these episodes in depth. In fact, uh, I also recommend my viewers to uh, go to my blog, thekorandilemma.com, or our website, thequran.com, and you can purchase uh, our book, uh, The Quran Dilemma, and in there we have done enough analyses uh, about all of these topics that we have covered and we will continue uh, to cover as well. Now, Bill, um, here is a question. Is the Quran, from your own study, a book of terror, or is it a book of peace? The answer is yes. <laughs> yes to both. <laughs> yes to both. And that is true. In fact, I would like to show our viewers a sample of some of these difficulties or even contradictions between one verse that will talk peacefully about others and another verse, for instance, that will talk a jihadist language, if we mm -hmm. wish, uh, against people in general. Uh, I would direct uh, your attention now to the monitor. Uh, we have a verse 
and it's found in the Quran chapter 49 verse 13 and as you can read here it says all mankind so it's talking to all people basically mm -hmm. we the we is reference to the God of Islam his name is Allah so Allah is saying we created you from a single pair meaning the reference to Adam and Eve male a and male female. and female and made you into nations which is basically you grew into tribes and nations as we have today and they uh, then that you may know each other basically and verily the most honored of you in the sight of God is basically the righteous one so the only distinction here in the sight of God when he judges you is basically who is righteous and who is not I mean you look at this verse and there really there is nothing whatsoever that is alarming about something like this now what's so alarming is when we discover that this particular verse and I'm going to mention another verse that uh, my, you know, Muslim friends uh, always like to cite. And it's found in chapter 2, verse 256, for instance. And it says, no compulsion right. in religion. In other words, they try to convince you and convince me and convince people that really Islam is a religion that does not compel people to accept it as a religion. Well, if that's the case, let us take a look, for instance, at the following verse that comes after this slide. In this particular slide, we read something that is really alarming. In fact, the very beginning of it says, slay the idolaters. This verse found in chapter 9, verse 5. And it says, slay the idolaters. Who are the idolaters? Those who do not worship the God of Islam. Mm -hmm. In fact, Christians and Jews are considered idolaters. According to the same chapter 9, verse 28, it says that the Christians basically worship Jesus as the Son of God. Therefore, they're idolaters because right. they're worshiping someone else beside God. And it makes a false claim against the Jews by stating that the Jews are also idolaters because they worship supposedly someone by the name Ezra. Whether Ezra is actually the prophet Ezra mm -hmm. that is mentioned in the Old Testament or someone else, we cannot find any tangible evidence to support such a claim. And let's assume, just assume, that indeed there was a group of uh, Jewish people who worshipped someone by the name Ezra. The Quran in its language that it's used in that particular verse actually generalized this against all Jews, right. calling all of them idolaters. And that's really what's so troubling. But let's go back again to this particular one uh, that we are watching on the screen right now chapter 9 verse 5 it says slay the idolaters wherever you find them and take them captives and besiege them and lie in wait for them in every ambush bill does this sound peaceful to you right now i'm not comfortable i'm not comfortable there's people here that want to take me captive they're waiting to ambush me this sounds like delta force <laughs> Or the Marines. Now, once again, our friends who are the Muslim people will tell us that actually you have to read this verse within its context. Now, you studied the Quran. What were the context of this chapter, for instance? Was there a specific event that you can take this verse and say, well, it applied 1,400 years ago. It doesn't apply today. Well, what we, you and I are going to let them in on a secret, which is this is the final chapter of the Quran. Right. Even though it's got, it says nine, there's 114 chapters. This is the concluding chapter. This is the wrap-up, the final thing. And yep. all of a sudden, I find that because I'm who I am, I can be slain for being who I am sitting here. That's all that's needed. And indeed, we're going to show even more evidence behind that. Did you know that this verse, Bill, is called the sword verse? Yes, the In fact, infamous sword exactly. verse. Exactly. Now, why would we call something like this the sword verse if Quran is actually a book of peace? In fact, I want to fill my viewers on something that is very important. There is something called the doctrine of abrogation. In mm -hmm. other words, the doctrine of cancellation. What does that mean? I mean, Bill, you've studied also again yes. this. Uh, can you tell our viewers, for instance, your understanding of the doctrine of abrogation? Well, first off, the doctrine of abrogation comes from the very Quran itself. True. Uh, the Arabs of the time of Muhammad were not stupid. All right. And so they listened to his revelations. And then finally they go, uh, Muhammad, you said something earlier that was different from this. Now you're supposed to be getting this from God. Surely God knows his own mind. What is the problem here? 
And of course they were also on Muhammad in another way, which was, if this is God, why didn't he just give you the whole thing all at once? What is this dribble dribble business? And then as we watch it dribbling out of you, you change things. And so he was confronted uh, with these questions. Why are you changing it? That is very true. And, and uh, we are going to discuss this doctrine in a later episode in more depth because it's a very crucial doctrine that uh, basically, in my mind, it is the doctrine that distinguishes between what we call moderate Muslims mm -hmm. and radical Muslims. In fact, the radicals actually, in my view, are the true followers of I Islam. Would, I would agree. But let's return for a moment. I think if we will look at any serious scholarly work on the Quran uh, that deals with trying to explain the Quran, the first thing they will say to you is, until you understand abrogation, you cannot understand the Quran. That's how s central this is. This is not just some minor problem. This Absolutely. is the very backbone of the Quran. Absolutely. And, and ladies and gentlemen, we're not talking about one verse only, but oh. this is a verse that I use as an example. In fact, I use this particular one because of its name. The nickname is the sword verse. And in fact, some of the studies that we have done prove that this verse have abrogated anywhere from 111 peaceful verses all the way to 124 peaceful verses. Now that's a big difference mm -hmm. here. As if you're taking 111 verses or 117 or 124 and you're just throwing them out. Basically, they're, they're canceled. They're gone. So what you have to live by now is a command like this. Now, if you are, Bill, a true follower of the Quran and Islam, what does this verse mean to you? Well, we know from the doctrine of abrogation that this verse is, by Allah's own word, better, stronger. So if I'm going to be a stronger Muslim, I need to be following this verse about slaying the idolaters. Not this earlier part, which is humanity's one spirit. So the humanity is one spirit, according to the Quran itself, is a weak statement. And the latter verse is stronger. In other words, basically, the God of Islam will decide later that he wants to issue a new command. Mm -hmm. And this new command will go ahead and cancel whatever commands came before it. I call the earlier verse the kitten verse and the later verse the tiger verse. <laughs> that's a, that's, a, that's a, a funny well, way we, of we looking see, at it. <laughs> well, it's kind of, there, we can see in here an evolution. We start off because Muhammad is in Mecca and he's a peaceful man. And then when he gets his full dose of Allah, he becomes a tiger. He's now a full-grown, mature Muslim. So this verse 9, or chapter 9, is the mature, fully developed, complete Muslim. The earlier one is the kitten phase. Not yet full. Right. I want to also add to, to uh, this discussion. Uh, not many people know that, for instance, every single chapter in the Quran starts with a very infamous phrase, in the name of Allah, the most merciful, except, the most compassionate, except chapter 9. Precisely. And when you study the, uh, the, the, the chapter 9 reason behind why this, what they call Bismillah, mm -hmm. because in Arabic it's Bismillah, uh, why is it missing? One of the reasons is this chapter deals with idolaters and the Besmela or the beginning, which is in the name of God, the most merciful, gives peace, yet God doesn't want to give people peace in this particular chapter. Therefore, it is missing from there. Mm -hmm. And that's really troubling to me because I tell my Muslim people, uh, basically, if the Quran is a book of peace, then why does this particular chapter misses this introduction? Now, I want to move on to also another example after this one. We talked about killing the idolaters in general. Let us take a, a, another closer look at uh, another troubling uh, passage found in the same chapter, chapter 9, verse 29. This time it says, again, I want to highlight the word fight. And by the way, the word fight, even though it's in English, might give you the impression that there is some sort of a spiritual fighting. Mm -hmm. Actually, the word fight in Arabic is a jihadist terminology that demands physical fighting. This time, the word fight is actually not against just idolaters in general. It is against people of the book. Now, do you know, Bill, who are these people of the book? Oh, yes. 
The, it, this is a very unusual statement, people of the book, and this means the Jews and the Christians, but it also is an insight into Arabia at the time. I think that the Quran was the first book ever written in Arabic. That is correct. And for the Arabs who had a very oral tradition, that the Christians and the Jews with books, this was special. They were a people set apart. It is said there were 360 religions practiced in Mecca. And, or idols, basically. Right. But these were all oral traditions. The Jews right. and the Christians had something special, the book. And we're going to cover this shortly. Now, here is what's so troubling to me about this particular verse. If, if we can take a look at it together and read. It says, fight those who believe not in Allah. And we said Allah is the name of the God of Islam. Mm -hmm. So your first crime is that you do not believe in the God of Islam. Exactly. So that by itself is a crime that demands a Muslim to fight you. What is your next crime? Nor the last day, meaning you do not believe in Judgment Day. Now let's, let's be fair. Christianity and Judaism does believe in the Day of Judgment. The Bible is filled with examples and verses and passages that warn of a Judgment Day. So this is, in my mind, just a false accusation. Mm -hmm. And also the fact that they do not believe in God. I mean, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to use the word Allah because Allah is not the name of the God of the Bible. But if the idea they do not believe in God, the Bible also is very clear that the Jews and the Christians are demanded to believe in the one God, the creator of heaven and earth and mankind. So what is the next crime? Nor hold that which is forbidden by Islam, basically. Now, this is a very dangerous one, by the way. Do you know that by drinking wine or beer or eating pork, you automatically qualify to fall under the judgment of this passage mm -hmm. because Islam prohibits wine, basically, and the eating of pork. So if someone drinks alcohol, and we're, even we're talking about a sip of alcohol, mm -hmm. you are violating one of the teachings of Islam, and hence you fall under the judgment of this passage. Does that sound like a peaceful religion to you, well, Bill? Well, basically what this is saying is if I do not follow Sharia law, which is a term we're going to be talking about later, uh, I'm in trouble. Why? Because I do not submit. Basically, this is saying I have to submit to Islam. I have to believe in Muhammad. I have to believe in Allah. And if not, I'm to be fought. And as you say, as we read the context of all this, this is not a fight in the sense of a debate. True. Now, uh, look at another thing. If we do not acknowledge the religion of truth, which is Islam, then we are in trouble because now Islam is commanding its followers to fight us. Now, Bill, this is talking about me and you. Mm. Me, I'm a, full, uh, a former Muslim. That mm. by itself is a crime. Oh, that's worse. And you <laughs> do not follow the religion of Islam, at least to my knowledge. No, I Are do you not. a Muslim? <laughs> I do not. Well, just by admitting this right now, we are incriminating ourselves under the command of this particular verse. And it's not only us. It's millions of people who live in the Western mm -hmm. side of the universe, in Europe, in the U.S., or even if you're a Christian or a Jew who live in the Middle East, you are a target for this command to be mm -hmm. fought. How does that make you feel, Bill? Do you feel peaceful about this? I don't feel peaceful, and as a matter of fact, I feel very uncomfortable, to be exact. Uh, I mean, if, if I have a Buddhist neighbor, I'm not concerned about their concern with me and my religion or lack thereof or anything. They make no demands on me. I have Jewish friends. They make no demands on me. Christian friends will invite me, but they make no demands. Now, Bill, you did study all of the isms, as you yeah, mentioned in episode one. <laughs> did you find any similar command in any of these religions to ask its followers to go and compel their religion on you by force? No. We do need to take a sidebar here. It is very common with people who don't know a lot about Islam to make the argument that all religions are the same. Let's skip over that. That's just the, and so therefore, one of the things that people do is they condemn all religions. But in particular, one of the things they'll say is, well, there's violence in the Old Testament as well. However, and I've done a statistical study of this, never mind the fact that the Quran contains enormously more amount of violence, 
The violence in the Quran and the violence in the Old Testament, and there's none in the New Testament, has an important distinction. The violence in the Old Testament is a history lesson. On this day, these people attacked this tribe. And I want to add to this. Uh, uh, I am majoring in biblical uh, studies. And I want to emphasize to people a couple of things. First of all, um, I appreciate the fact that you're calling it violence. It actually has a spiritual meaning. God, Yahweh, the Lord of the covenant, is teaching his people a lesson. There is sin, mm -hmm. and sin must be eradicated. So it has a meaning. In fact, if you go to the book of Joshua, it talks about eradicating certain groups and nations that God told Abraham almost 500 years earlier that he is going to be patient and waiting until their sins have been fulfilled. In fact, if you study the history behind these nations, they used to sacrifice their own babies and children. Mm -hmm. This is an abomination in the sight of God. God did not create man to be sacrificed. He created animals for purposes like this. Yes, the God of the covenant basically demanded that faith and blood sacrifice is the way for salvation, but he never really talked about sacrificing your own children as a result of this. People don't understand this. Well, there's another thing as well. If we will, that's like a lesson in history. This is not only now, it is universal and into the future. It says it, there's no end to this. That is true. And I want to uh, add to uh, what uh, Bill is, is talking about. For instance, if you go to the Bible, to the book of Joshua, where we find most of these accounts that Bill is talking about, take the book of Joshua out, you're never going to find anything tangible in the rest of the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, that talks about uh, violence, if we want to wish, or at least eradicating uh, uh, violent people or violent nations. Now, that's different. There, that's basically descriptive. It's an event. It's mm -hmm. narrative of something that took place back then. This in the Quran, command. this is a prescriptive. Yes. It's like going to a doctor and getting a prescription and says, whenever you feel ill, go and take this medicine. Mm -hmm. And also, you mentioned something about chapter 9, even though it's number 9 out of 114 chapters in the Quran that we have today, at least. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's the ninth chapter. It means, actually, historically, that it's either the last verse, a chapter, or some will say it's the one next to last. In fact, chapters 5 and 9 are very crucial in terms of understanding the direction that Islam and Muhammad took in terms of spreading Islam. It turned from peaceful all the way to uh, jihadist, mm -hmm. uh, basically, mentality. Would you like to elaborate on that? One of the things I would like to elaborate on is how successful this was. Muhammad preached the religion of Islam in Mecca for 13 years and got about 150 people to follow him. Some account says even less than 100. All right, but humor me, 150. That's about 10 a year, all right? Right. However, when he switched to this later jihad, he was overwhelmingly successful. My figures indicate that he started persuading about 10,000 a year. So this program was overwhelmingly successful. And indeed, to such a degree, as best we can tell from the history that's been left, when Muhammad died, every Arab was a Muslim, and Muhammad did not have a single enemy left standing. This was an enormously successful program. It, was, it worked. And I want to add to what uh, uh, my colleague Bill is talking about here. What Bill is saying is Muhammad just using peaceful methods by inviting people wasn't successful in converting uh, more than 100 to 150 to be his followers. He was in a state of weakness. Mm -hmm. Then he moved to Medina, found himself now not only a religious leader and a prophet, he found himself to be a political leader. In fact, that was the nucleus that started what we call the Islamic Ummah or community or nation, if you want to yes. call it. Now, uh, using force was one of the ways that Muhammad was able not only to intimidate his enemies, but also to attract his own followers by giving him these promises. If you are successful, you can take spoils, women as concubines. If you die, you go straight to paradise. Your sins are forgiven. And on top of that, if you're a male, which is all of them were male at that time that were fighting with Muhammad, you get 72 virgins in heaven. I mean, what a sweet deal, Bill. Well... My way of putting it is, he made religion pay. Right. I mean, this was, as a matter of fact, 
we'll be talking more about the Hadith or traditions. There are many Hadith which refer to the wealth that Muslims got because they got 80% of what was captured. Muhammad got 20%. Correct. And by the way, the Muslims of the day were complimentary to Muhammad for taking only 20% because according to Arab custom, the leader of raider bands got 25%. So Muhammad, if you will, cut them an even better deal, but they got rich. And there yeah, are absolutely. many hadith which refer to the wealth that came to Islam. Now, one, one important thing I want to mention, after the death of Muhammad, there were some that decided they want to leave Islam. <laughs> yes, they did. And the Khalifa Abu Bakr, who is the very first, basically, governor that took the throne after Muhammad, he wasn't a prophet, but he was a political leader, fought them in what is infamously known as the battles of the apostates. Yes. Now, my question is this. Why would you fight people that elect to leave a religion and make a free choice? Isn't Islam a religion of peace? What's well, interesting about Abu Bakr when uh, there, were, there were a lot of Muslims, Arabs who had converted to Islam, and Muhammad died, they said, you know, we've tried the Islam thing, and it was fine, but we're out of here now. But Abu Bakr's statement was not just about religion because every Muslim owed a tax, the zakat, which we will get to more later. And I love the way he put it. He says, if they only owe a baby goat, I will collect it. So it, this is not just religious, it is political as well. The taxes will be collected. You're a Muslim, you'll pay the tax. Absolutely. Uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen, these are very interesting discussions. Uh, there is a lot to cover, Bill. Unfortunately, uh, we're almost running out of time, and uh, I, all I can say is basically we will continue on with this discussion in our uh, coming episode because it is very crucial for our viewers and listeners to uh, see for themselves and hear about what the Quran teaches and what Islam is all about. Uh, uh, Bill, would you like to give a final thought before we uh, My end? final thought is is that I find this material fascinating. What we're doing here is to unveil, this is an important show in that it used to be very difficult to understand Islam. One of the messages that we are presenting to people now is it's fascinating and it's easy to do now. And in this book that you've worked on, The Quran Dilemma, a magnificent work which makes the Quran transparent. People okay. can now, for the first time in humanity's history, Everyone can understand Islam. Bill, thank you so much. And I would like to remind our viewers that they can go to the website that is shown on the screen and also use the email provided to them to send us their thoughts, their questions, and any of their comments or suggestions. Uh, and uh, we'll be more than happy to respond to them, entertain them, and hopefully also you can give us any suggestions of any future topics that uh, are in your heart that you would like for us to discuss. Bill, very interesting discussion. Thank you so much for oh. joining me, and I look forward to our next episode. Me too. With that in mind, uh, my uh, viewers, uh, thank you so much. This is Al Fadi, uh, your host of the Islamic Dilemma. Mega blessings to you.